Director of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are pleased to be with you today to talk with you about where we are with respect to COVID-19 for the entire state of Maine for today, Thursday, April 15th, 2021. I'll start by providing an update on the public health side and then turn things over to Commissioner Wambrew before we go to questions. And I begin my update on a sad note. The Maine CDC has received the report of another individual who died with COVID-19. He was a man in his 80s from Oxford County. And his passing brings to the total number of deaths in Maine that are associated with COVID-19 to now stand at 758. We'd like to take a moment to offer his friends, his family, and his entire community our deepest condolences. Overall across the state, there are now a total of 55,953 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 579 cases since yesterday. Of those cases from yesterday that were reported, it's important to note that not all of them received their diagnosis and were reported to us in the pre previous 24 hours. Of those cases, 124 were individuals diagnosed yesterday on the 14th, 251 were individuals from the 13th, 64 were individuals from April 12th, 55 were from April 11th, and 94 were from April 10th. Now this information is on our website. If you take a look at the graph that shows the day-to-day -day changes in cases, but I wanted to make sure everyone here was aware that not all 579 of those cases occurred overnight. They are still concerning while we're on that topic. Folks are aware that we have experienced an increase of cases of COVID-19 here across the state. That increase has been reflected not just by the number of cases, but also by the increase, say, in the positivity rate, which as I'll mention in a moment, now stands at 3.5% whereas just a few days ago, it was in the, 3 the low 3% range. That increase in cases has also been met with an increase in hospitalizations. About a week ago, there were approximately 70 people in the hospital in Maine, and now that number unfortunately stands at over 100. We're also seeing that those who are hospitalized are younger than they were before. As we've also mentioned, as I talked about a little bit on Tuesday, the average age of cases, of new cases of COVID-19 in Maine has come down. Earlier in this year and late last year, the average age of new cases was about 35. I'm sorry, it was about 43. And now it is about 35. All of this shows how opportunistic the virus is. As older parts of the state and older populations of the state have been vaccinated, the virus is now spreading more rapidly among younger populations. And as much as we wish that they would not be as seriously affected, they are. Again, hospitalization rates are going up as well. All of this suggests the reason and the urgency behind why vaccination remains critical now. Vaccination is available in Maine to anyone over the age of 16. And as I'll mention again in a moment as well, I recommend everybody who is eligible for a vaccine, take some time to find and schedule an appointment. Going back to hospitalizations, we've now had 1,751 cumulative hospitalizations. And right now in the state, 107 people are currently in the hospital. 34 of them are in a critical care unit and 13 of them are on a ventilator. Again, our, P our positivity rate for PCR tests has gone up. It now stands at 3.5%, and our testing volume is at 655 PCR tests for every 100,000 people. But there's a lot of activity happening on the vaccines and vaccination fronts. Cumulatively, Maine has administered 945,186 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And overall, across the state, 48% of those who are eligible to get a COVID vaccine, those 16 and over, 48% have received their first dose and 36% of that group have gotten the shots that they need at this point. So we continue to make progress on the vaccination front. 
Now, looking into next week, today, Maine CDC is placing its order for the vaccines that will be coming into our allocation next week. We were allotted and are ordering 21,060 first doses of Pfizer vaccine and 15,400 first doses of Moderna vaccine. Because of the nationwide pause on the use of the J&J &J vaccine <clears throat> recommended and put into place by the US CDC and the US FDA, there is no new supply of J&J &J vaccine coming into the state next week. What does all this mean? Well, it means that there is a small increase in the supply of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. But unfortunately, without the J&J &J vaccine, net of net, there are actually 230 fewer first doses coming into the state's allocation next week as there were this week. Speaking of J&J, &J, I wanted to provide an update on the status of the pause on the use of that vaccine. Yesterday, the US CDC's expert advisory panel met to discuss the most recent scientific findings around that vaccine. The panel ultimately decided to hold on any decision regarding lifting of the pause of the J&J &J vaccine for at least another week, perhaps a bit longer. What that means is that for now, the pause on the J&J &J vaccine remains in effect. And Maine is not administering any J&J &J vaccine pursuant to this pause. I've briefed medical and public health leaders in the state about yesterday's discussion and will continue to do so as we learn more from the US CDC and the US FDA. But it's very important to note that there are two other vaccines, that by Pfizer and that by Moderna, that are still in use. For example, our mobile vaccination unit is using Moderna vaccine in Oxford this week and in Wyndham next week. Speaking of which, there are appointments available for the mobile unit that will be in Wyndham starting on Sunday. Appointments are available. You, if going to Wyndham or if you are from the Wyndham area and you'd like to be vaccinated at the mobile unit next week, please don't hesitate. Please make an appointment. The best way to do so is to call our community vaccination line. The number to call is 888-445-4111. Again, 888-445-4111 to schedule an appointment for the Wyndham location next week to get vaccinated. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Wambrew. Director Shaw, as April vacation week begins in Maine, the race between COVID-19 vaccinations and variants is in high gear. While we rank second in the nation on the percent of state residents getting a first vaccine dose, our case count is rising rapidly at the same time. People traveling have been known to cause outbreaks of COVID-19, often unknowingly, once they return home. This is why testing for COVID-19 remains critical. Getting a test protects you, your family, and your community. It identifies people infected by the virus early, often before symptoms appear, and getting a test when you have a fever, headache, chills, fatigue, or difficulty breathing allows you to determine whether that's just allergies or a common cold or this highly contagious and serious disease. If you test positive, you can isolate to limit the number of additional people infected you can save lives. For these reasons, Maine requires people traveling to states outside of New England to test or quarantine. This means that you must quarantine for 10 days upon return to Maine unless you obtain and receive a negative COVID-19 test from a sample taken no longer than 72 hours prior to arrival. Maine strongly urges people to test prior to arrival. However, if you do come here first, it is important that you quarantine while you're waiting for your test results. This is especially important for families traveling during the April vacation. A COVID-19 vaccine has not yet been authorized for children under the age of 16, and children are increasingly catching and spreading the virus. A number of main school districts will be offering testing at the end of next week as a way to screen for COVID-19 as people return home 
from the brink, the return to school from the brink. Since last fall, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services has issued over 20,000 rapid tests to over 100 schools in Maine. And we expect to do more school-based uh, testing with the new funds from the American Rescue Act. Additionally, you can learn about where you can go to get a COVID-19 test by searching Maine COVID testing, by visiting the Keep Maine Healthy site, or calling 211. COVID-19 testing in Maine is free of charge. So too are COVID-19 vaccines. Being fully vaccinated exempts you from the need to get a COVID-19 test or a quarantine. We urge anyone age 16 and older to get vaccinated now. In addition to calling the number that Dr. Shaw mentioned, you can also find vaccination appointments by searching Maine COVID vaccine sites or visiting Maine COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you. And we'll go back to questions. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the first question for today goes to Megan from WMTW. Thank you for taking my question. So you mentioned that we're seeing a higher positivity rate more cases, and this is as we vaccinate more people. So, you know, at first glance or first blush, that would seem like those two things are kind of at odds or maybe counterintuitive. But so even though all of those 579 cases weren't uh, diagnosed yesterday, they still do represent positive cases. So really, what are the key factors driving the rise? Is it is it just that the younger population has not had access to vaccines until recently, or is there something else? Um, Megan, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I think there, there are at least two things that are going on, uh, perhaps even more, but you put your finger on one of them. Uh, we actually talked about this at our morning meeting. Uh, what, what sometimes happens in, in epidemics, or in our case, a pandemic, is that there can actually be multiple different types of transmission going on at once in different populations. And maybe those populations mix, but maybe they don't. And I think one of the things that we're sort of seeing nationwide and perhaps in Maine is that many older folks have been vaccinated. That's great because the case numbers as we as seen from the average age, ages of hospitalizations, those have come down. Those folks are protected. But they didn't necessarily do a lot of interacting with younger folks in Maine. Some, of course, but not in the same way that younger folks do. So there are sort of two separate pods for epidemiological purposes. And there's still a lot of transmission, indeed, maybe even more transmission happening in that younger unvaccinated group. That's why getting vaccinated, if you're younger, you're eligible right now, that's really one of the best things you can do. We've continued to see robust uptake for vaccine in Maine, and I encourage everyone, if you're 16 and over, to start thinking about how, when, and where you want to get your shot. The other thing, though, that's also potentially happening, Megan, it, it will be, uh, it's hard to know exactly at this time what, how much of a role it's playing, are variants. We continue to see more variants be detected across the state of Maine, and at least two of those variants, probably three, are associated with being more contagious. They may also be more severe, although scientists are still sorting out those data right now. But the, B, uh, the variants that were identified in different parts of the world that have made their way to the United States and in Maine uh, are definitely known to be more contagious. And so when you have a combination of a population that's been unvaccinated, that mixes a lot together, and with a, with a virus that's more contagious, I think that's a lot of what we're seeing in the spread. If I could just follow up um, briefly, when we were talking earlier about variants, earlier meaning a month or so ago, um, we talked a, a little bit about them being more contagious, but not necessarily more deadly, or, um, but we're seeing more people in the hospital and, um, and hospitalizations are up. And so, is that not true anymore? So is it not only more contagious, but you can actually get sicker? That, that, is, that is the current thinking, Megan. Up in, uh, when the when variants were first described several months ago, uh, the initial analysis and the analysis that continues to be the case by scientists in the UK and South Africa and elsewhere have found that the variants are not only more contagious, but they land people in the hospital at higher rates and cause death at higher rates. This past weekend, there was a paper published in a very reputable medical journal, The Lancet, suggesting that 
you know, there, there's, there's some other questions that were raised. And again, so scientists are sorting out the magnitude of how much more severe they may be. But I think the prevailing wisdom remains that the variants are not just more contagious, but also more severe if you happen to get infected by them. That certainly squares with what we are seeing in Maine, which is more cases, more hospitalizations, and the age of people who are getting infected and hospitalized are both much lower than what it was just four months ago. I might add just two points though on not necessarily the positive side because this is not great news, but the first, first one is that we do have therapeutics now that we didn't have a year ago and in different parts of our period of time, which have helped lessen the severity of people in hospitals. And the second thing is that our age-based approach to vaccination has helped keep our death rate here in Maine low. So we continue to rank throughout the pandemic the, having the fourth lowest death rate. And even in the last week when our case counts have been going up, we're in the top 10 in terms of the states with the lowest death rate. So it is a cause of concern. We are hoping again, people will wear masks stay physically distanced and test it if they're not vaccinated. And if they can get a vaccine appointment, do so. But we also know that our strategy of trying to prevent those people most at risk from serious illness and death seems to be working. I could add just one more thing because this is this discussion is very important, Megan. When we talk about variants, uh, people, it, it pushes a lot of the scary buttons, right? But there's also it's also important to know that the vaccines that we have, Pfizer and Moderna, are effective against those variants. So yes, these variants can be spread more easily and they probably land people in the hospital at higher rates, but we're not powerless. Not only do we have masks and distancing, we've got, a va we've got vaccines that are very effective. Thank uh, you. I'm gonna, yep, thanks, Megan. I'm gonna turn to Steve Collins next. Oh, hold on, Steve, you're, you're on mute. Okay, now can you hear me? Sure can, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so we have a, uh, it seems that the, the rates are sharply higher in Androscoggin County than they are in most, most places in the state. And I'm curious if you have any reason, if you know of any reason why it's so bad here. Well, in recent days or recent weeks, Steve, much of the in increase in Androscoggin County uh, was being driven by the outbreak at Bates College. Yeah. Um, that, that was accounting for the bulk of the increase of cases. Uh, but interestingly, because of the volume of testing they were doing, there wasn't, the positivity rates were in line because there was a lot of testing happening, but the growth in cases was largely uh, their, their, their outbreak has, um, certainly not saying it subsided, but they've done, they've been very, very uh, aggressive in making sure students and others are remaining in isolation, getting tested and retesting. And I received a report this morning that thankfully uh, their numbers of new cases are starting to show a deceleration. Uh, there are other outbreaks happening in Androscoggin County, but to really get a better sense of what's happening at a community level versus just on the college, it'll take us a bit more time uh, to see how the cases evolve. Right now, though, much of what's happening and unfolding in Androscoggin is a function of Bates, but certainly there's community transmission happening everywhere in the state, not just in Androscoggin County, everywhere in the state. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, over to Patty White next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, how much of a setback is it that the J&J &J vaccine is being lost for at least another week? And one thing I'm wondering, wondering about in particular is for the people who are prime candidates for it because it's one shot, is Maine going to switch gears and try to get the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine to those folks or are we gonna hang tight until there's a final decision? Uh, so let me start with the latter question, uh, Patty, because I think that informs the answer to the former. Uh, the answer is no, we're not, we're not, um, we're not waiting around. Uh, we have already pivoted many operations, not all, but many, to using mainly the Moderna vaccine because it doesn't have the same temperature requirements. So we've, we've talked, I've talked about the mobile unit here where we pivoted within a matter of hours on Tuesday. We found out about the pause on J&J &J at around 7.20 in the morning. And by 1 p.m. that day, 
we were already switching to and were administering Moderna vaccine. We're doing the same thing in other settings. Uh, the commissioner and I spoke earlier about a clinic that's occurring uh, in Bangor for, 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 for folks who are at a high risk. That's not stopping. Our public health nurses are continuing to work uh, to vaccinate at-risk groups and our work to vaccinate folks in homebound settings. We're making sure that we get them Moderna, not J&J. &J. So we're, we're, we're still charging ahead. Okay, great. Um, and then I've heard some confusion about when to wear a mask if you're fully vaccinated, especially, or, or when kids are involved. So if you've got a bubble where all the adults are fully vaccinated, but there are a couple kids in the mix, can adults assume that the risk of transmission is low enough that they can take their masks off or is it a bigger risk than it may seem? Um, you know, so here's the bottom line, Patty. I would recommend in that setting with a group of fully vaccinated adults in a private residence, but with unvaccinated kids, I would still recommend wearing a mask in that setting. Really, um, and, and let me let me let me say why. Um, there's still the possibility that kids might get affected. There are some early data to suggest as well that kids may be that the variants that we've talked about may be they may affect kids in ways that the prior virus, the original virus, didn't. That is to say, kids may be a touch more susceptible to the uh, to the variant forms. Uh, than they were to the others. Now, I don't want to overstate this because the vaccines are spectacularly effective. But this is a situation where, you know, th th there there can be risks to kids. There have been cases of the this immune disorder that can follow severe cases of COVID. Um, and so, you know, th the best thing to do to keep kids safe is even if the adults have been vaccinated to wear a mask, uh, because there's still that possibility that kids could get it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn to Chris Costa next. Uh, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, can you just kind of explain a little bit about the, the case reporting? And you kind of talked about how it's been, um, we're not re reporting necessarily the individual cases each day kind of thing. I'm just kind of wondering, when did that happen, that, that kind of shift? Why did it happen? And then it, I guess as part of that, how many outbreaks are there that the state's currently looking into right now? Okay, sure, Chris. Uh, we'll get you a number of open outbreaks right now. Um, we'll, we'll have that for you in just a bit, maybe even by the end of the briefing, uh, what, the, the total number that are currently open across the state. In terms of case reporting, what happens is, is this. Um, people can get diagnosed from COVID, for COVID, in, in a number of settings. They might go to their doctor's office. They might go to one of our swab and send sites. They may get one of the rapid tests. And those are reported to Maine CDC in two ways in parallel. We are what is called a dual reporting state. The provider who ordered the test reports it to us and the laboratory that conducted the test, whether it's the Maine CDC lab or Quest or LabCorp, they also report it to us. That way we don't miss anything. We get all of those reports that come in every single day. They come in overnight. And the first step is to take all of those and figure out the duplicates, because in theory, we get two reports for every person. So we deduplicate everything. We then have to, after we've unduplicated all the reports, then go through and assign them to be investigated. Where we are right now is that the number of new cases that are coming in that require investigation is more than we can process in a particular 24 hour period. So we take extra time, we have extra shifts, we have more people on the weekends who are coming in at night and other times to process those cases so we can assign them out and understand whether this is a new diagnosis. So for example, Chris, or let's take a hypothetical John Smith who gets tested in four different places. We've got to make sure that if we say we get all of those test results, we have to check them against the, the right person to make sure that we're deduplicating there as well, so that there's only one new case, not that we're reporting results. So we've got to do all of that back end work and then actually go forward with the investigation. That process takes a little bit of time. And that's where that's where when I say X number of these cases were reported on Wednesday or versus Tuesday, that's really what I'm talking about. Okay, and just, just to quickly follow up on that, did did the state have was the state following this kind of same uh, protocol of reporting several days of cases on one day 
back when we had like the high number of cases around November, December, or did something change kind of behind the scenes that we don't know about or? No, no, Chris, the way, uh, so I'm glad you asked that. So we, the way that we've reported these daily numbers has been the case ever since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I wanted to just make sure in these briefings that I was just clear that these are not cases within 24 hours. Now, after, as we've experienced more cases, so generally speaking, we are able to keep pace with new cases within a 24 hour period. Uh, so I haven't had to have that qualification, but after we get more than four to 500 reports a day, um, we have to make sure we bring in other people who can process those, but that's not a new thing. That's not a change in operations. That's what we were doing the last time we experienced an increase back in November, or December of last year. So this is a continuation. The other really important point, Chris, is that on our website, in the graphic that displays the number of cases, you may look at that and say, well, wait a minute, Shaw said that today there were 500 and something cases, but when I look at what we saw, it's only 200. That's because when we display these things on our website, we, we, we place cases in the day in which they were diagnosed or the day in which folks started showing symptoms, which is epidemiologically the way it's supposed to be. To totally. And then mm -hmm. my last question, I guess, would be um, just about the kind of the increases we're seeing. I know that, um, you know, Megan has touched on this, Steve has touched on this, um, but I guess I just, uh, I know we've been hammering kind of the healthy habits, right? The masking, the distancing, making sure we avoid crowds, hand washing. These are things we've been talking about for more than a year now. Um, is there a reason why we would start to see an increase in cases now? I mean, is it people becoming lax? Are they tired of following these protocols? Especially as we've added the tool of vaccines, which, I mean, as we can see, they're not, um, uh, not, I'm not trying to speak to their effectiveness. I'm just saying that, you know, it, it's not, um, you know, completely shutting off our cases, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, Chris, I know you're, you're right to, to go in that direction. We ask ourselves the same questions. What's changed? Or to put it differently, what, what, what causes the spikes and what then what causes the declines? Um, some of it, I think, is driven by variants right now. And that's not just a main phenomenon. That is a eastern seaboard, northern part of the United States phenomenon based on the number of variants that we've detected. Um, some of it may be uh, with folks saying, you know what, we've been at it a year, I need a break, that's understandable. We've gotten some recent data around travel. Travel is up, so that could be a factor as well. Um, and then there are other scientific hypotheses around to what extent there are other factors like things like temperature and humidity. Often in, a, in, a, in an outbreak or in an epidemic, Chris, there are so many factors going on at once. And it's usually not until after the fact that all of them are disaggregated. Actually, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a paper published about an outbreak from the 70s uh, of, a, of a respiratory disease where there's just been some new thinking around what was driving some of that. So it just gives you a sense that a lot of this is sorted out after we get all of the data at the back end very difficult in the moment to know exactly what is driving any one thing. Usually it's a constellation of factors, not one specific thing. Sure. And then this is the last question, I promise. Just because um, Commissioner Lambrew had talked about travel and, and uh, April vacation a moment ago, is there a recommendation from the CDC or DHHS at this time about traveling outside of the state? Are you asking people to not do that right now because of the variants? No, I, I don't. Commissioner, go ahead. I think yeah. that we're gonna probably say the same thing. Mm -hmm. We urge people to travel safely. People can travel if they follow the protocols, keep distance, wear the masks, wash their hands, make sure that they don't get out, go out if they're not feeling well. We do recommend testing frequently when you are traveling because of your going to a different place and having different exposures. As I said earlier, people should test before they come back if at all possible, so they're not quarantining when they come home, waiting for their test results. And again, we have 30 sites in Maine that are state-supported swab and sends that are available to the public for testing. There's another 63 Walgreens that do the rapid antigen test for people with symptoms or people who want to serially test so they can be at work and go back to what they need to do if they're essential workers. So we, we advise people to travel safely, not to not necessarily not travel. Okay, thank you all. Thanks for the patience. Yep, absolutely, Chris. Uh, let me go to Amy Brown next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, some of the vaccine hesitancy comes from people who are uh, 
planning to have children and worry about potential reproductive problems later on. A listener asks if you can comment on that and if there are any sources of information. I know it's early on to know about that, but if there's anything that you recommend that they look at or read regarding the vaccines and reproductive issues. Sure, Amy. There have been some concerns raised in different quarters around the the myth that vaccines, particularly the mRNA vaccines, may affect fertility. There's absolutely no evidence to support that. And indeed, in the clinical trials that were done for both of those vaccines, that by Pfizer and that by Moderna, there was no evidence whatsoever that fertility was affected. And indeed, in both of those clinical trials, a number of women became pregnant. And not only, again, was there any effect on fertility, the vaccine was found to be perfectly safe and those pregnancies were uncomplicated. These data are available on the US CDC's website as well as the WHO's website. And I just, I wanna say this again, there are no data to suggest that the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines have any impact whatsoever on fertility or the health of the baby. And is that the same for the J&J and presumably the AstraZeneca with the different technology that's used in those? Well, yes, based on everything we know about the J&J vaccine, uh, I haven't seen all the data on the AstraZeneca, but that's my understanding. It wouldn't have been approved by regulators in Europe and the UK and Canada were that not the case. Okay, great. And following up on this issue about variants and younger people, when you talk about more hospitalizations among younger people, are you saying that a larger proportion of the people that are in the hospital, a larger percentage of people who are currently hospitalized are younger than was seen before, or a real number of younger people is are hospitalized? I would assume it's the second because there are more people hospitalized overall. Uh, yeah, so that's what No, it's, it's, it's a bit more the latter, but it's also that the average age of people who are hospitalized in Maine has come down over the past few months. Okay. Do you know what that age is right now? Um, I can get it for you. It's in my notes from Tuesday, um, but I don't, I don't want to speculate or misremember it, so we, we can get that for you. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Uh, let me turn it over to Patrick Whittle next. Uh, thank you very much. I had a couple quick questions. Um, for Commissioner Lambrew, re regarding the travel recommendations, is, uh, do those remain the same in, in, in regards to the sort of the state specific guidance about which, uh, which states people need to acquire a, a, a negative test before returning and, and things like that? Or have those changed? And if not, is it possible that they might? Yep, so early in March, Governor Mills announced that we are allowing people to go back and forth to all New England states without the requirement to test or quarantine, although it's still recommended, especially with what's been happening with COVID-19 in Maine and in New England. Uh, if you go to other states, that is where the requirement does continue to hold. We are scheduled to change that policy on May 1 to be the opposite which is the presumption is you can travel without testing or quarantining unless we designate states that have either a high number of variants of concern or have other epidemiological data that give us concern. We are not yet to May 1st though. So that's why with the April vacation upon us, we really want to encourage families, school teachers, school staff who are taking vacations and happen to be traveling to follow those protocols of testing, Quarantine needs as the quarantining is needed, wearing a mask and following our protocols. I see. Um, why uh, why May first specifically? Is there some kind of threshold we're expected to pass around then? So we set May first back in early March because that was when President Biden said that we would have enough vaccine doses for all adult Americans. We also still anticipate that we will be getting to a larger and larger fraction of our residents who are fully vaccinated, which does mean that that kind of the levels of protection won't be the same. Uh, we will continue to keep an eye on that date to see if there do, do need to be any changes. But at this point, we will anticipate going to that new travel policy on May 1st. Right. Um, the Bangor Daily News reported that uh, a, lot, a lot of the uh, 
the new the current cases of coronavirus are happening in small towns as opposed to in urban areas. Is there anything that's that's driving that? Um, not specifically, Patrick. I think it's that what we're seeing continuing now is community transmission. Um, it, it's it's not so much that there's one predominating over the other. It's happening both in small towns as well as in urban areas. It's what we would expect a virus to do, right? Um, when, when they when they take hold somewhere, they don't necessarily know whether it's a small town or a large urban area. So no, it's not that there's anything specific or unique or different. Uh, the virus is spreading across communities. It's what it's been doing for quite some time now. So it's sort of another example of the kind of opportunistic nature of the virus. Indeed, yep. It's tenacious, it's opportunistic. It goes where there are people who are susceptible. So, um, fi finally, the, the state of New Hampshire is, is approaching uh, changes to its, its, uh, its mask, its statewide mask rules. Is, does anything like that seem to be on the horizon in the state of Maine? No. no. In stereo. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Over to Stephanie at ABC7. Stephanie? Sorry. Hello there. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Hi, so I have a question um, and it's it's regarding uh, travelers, um, you know, uh, people from the state of Maine traveling to other places, coming back. Um, say someone has their first vaccine done. Um, when they get back, do they need to quarantine? Should they get a test? Is that not necessary? Yeah. Yes, uh, so the, the answer is when, if someone is not fully, let me state it more positively. The, uh, the need not to quarantine or test when you come back applies to folks who are fully vaccinated. And fully vaccinated there is a, is a bit of a term of art. What we mean by fully vaccinated, and this is on our website, this is not inside baseball, fully vaccinated means someone who is 14 days out from their second dose of Pfizer or Moderna or 14 days out from their single dose of J&J. So if you only got your first dose and you're you went, we went on vacation in between your first two doses. When you come back, you're not fully vaccinated. And so the normal quarantine or test rules would apply. Okay, great. That's all I had. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, over to Joe Lawler. Yes, hi. Um, just uh, kind of piggybacking on the questions about um, younger people and uh, also just kind of regional we're seeing, um, you know, amongst New England and Northeast states, <coughs> excuse me, a, a, a big increase. Uh, and I kind of noticed that same pattern happened at the beginning of the pandemic. It started out much worse in, say, Massachusetts and New York, and then kind of migrated here. Um, is there any, can you shed some light on, on why it, the pat, that pattern may have happened, maybe happening? Yeah, Joe, I, 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 I'll look into it a bit more. You raise a good question. I, I haven't sort of, um, I haven't done the, the time series analysis to see whether what we saw two or three or four weeks ago in other states is now working its way here. Uh, I, actually, Joe, kind of what I've seen is um, that to the extent that's the case, it's relatively compressed. Uh, that is to say, spikes that happened elsewhere uh, happen here within a matter of days, suggesting it's not direct transmission, but just movement of patterns of the virus. But I'll have to take a closer look, Joe. I, I don't have much more for you right now on that, but, um, it, but I, won't, I won't waste the opportunity to remind folks though, that we're not powerless here. Uh, masking still is incredibly important. Physically distancing is important. And of course, nowadays getting vaccinated. Uh, eligibility is open for everyone over 16. This is a good time to go get to find an appointment. Okay, and my follow-up question is with, um, I, I know we're a lot of discussion about um, people under 30 are uh, getting uh, infected at higher rates now. And um, as we know, a lot of younger people work in the tourism industry. And uh, even now we're starting to get more tourists and that'll uh, ramp up in May and June, et cetera. Is there any thought about 
I mean, I know it's open to all age groups, but maybe setting aside some clinics specifically for tourism industry, kind of like what we did with teachers and school staff. Yeah, so we have, I've been talking with Commissioner Johnson about this very idea. We're hopeful when we get to increase supply, we'll have some of these options. We do recognize the fact that, and we saw this last summer, when people come to Maine, they often go to restaurants or to hotels, to entertainment settings, and those workers are on the front line. We also um, have been thinking about workers in grocery stores or workers in the food processing industry here in Maine. Migrant farm, the, market, the seasonal workers will be arriving in Maine as well in beginning in May and June. So we are looking at all of those special populations for potentially special clinics, but that's contingent on supply. We are hopeful that um, as the federal government has indicated, beginning in early May, we'll be seeing significantly more doses, which will enable us to do those sorts of targeted and special clinics. We'd love to be able to do them. We're just waiting for that supply. Thanks, Joe. Over to Caitlin next. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew, um, assuming I'm the Caitlin you were speaking about. Um, I think I might be the only one. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, has the state been able to secure enough vaccine to continue offering at least 250 shots a day through its mobile clinic? And where were you able to get those from? Right, so for next week for Wyndham, the mobile unit will get a direct allocation uh, from our state allotment, the allotment that I outlined a moment ago. And then from uh, for the remainder of this week, while there are operations in Oxford, we source vaccine from a number of different sites, as we talked about on Tuesday, um, all across the state, and not a single appointment was canceled in the in the process. Okay, um, can we maybe get a list of where you got those from, or should I follow up with those? Uh, no, we got them from four, three or four places: from Maine General, from Martin's Point, from Downey's Community Hospital. Um, I think some from Callis, but I'll check with the immunizations program if I've left any off. Okay, um, we reached out to Maine General earlier this week to ask about you know the number of vaccines, and they said the state promised to like return or kind of like reimburse the vaccines that it borrowed for the clinic next week, um, on top of whatever they may be allocated last week. Um, is this true? And can you kind of explain how you guys are you know thinking about that? Just just in the way you outlined, Caitlin, we, we borrowed those doses so we could convert the mobile unit in a matter of hours, but we also know that those are busy vaccination sites. We were able to use them from doses that were not scheduled until later in the week, and then we can shift doses around and make sure that they can continue their operations. So we're not permanently taking anything from anyone. This is just more evidence of what we do every single day, which is move doses around the state. This This was not a a permanent decrement to their allocation. Okay, um, and I guess what I would wonder about that is, so if Maine General had 500 that were left over that weren't going to be used for this week and the state is like really adamant about um, making sure that you know no vaccines are wasted, why I guess give that many back if there wasn't any use for them this week or any plan to use them this week? So Caitlin, um, sites get allocation for about an eight day period. Um, and so it, it's not as if they're getting just the vials they need for that day from us. So if, if when we moved doses on Tuesday, we moved, I think some second doses that would not have been administered because second doses get, it gets technical, but you ask a technical question. Second doses get shipped and allocated on a Sunday schedule. So we can use second doses that would not have been used until the subsequent week, because second doses for week 20 have already been shipped. So we can use second doses for week 20 in week 19, and then replenish those second doses without impacting anybody's availability. Okay, I see, that, that is helpful, thank you. Um, and my last question is that we noticed um, that at least in two counties that schools seem to be making up the bulk of um, open outbreaks right now. Uh, is this something that you have observed throughout the state and how long has this been the case? Uh, schools have had outbreaks since, since they went back in in, in August. Um, but what I think is really important there, Caitlin, is that we have still not seen substantial transmission happening in schools. What we've seen a lot of is schools being places where outbreaks are detected, but less to be places where outbreaks or transmission is occurring. 
And I'll add that we also have seen in the recent months a significant decline in the number of outbreaks in long-term care facilities, congregate living facilities. So the denominator has changed as well. So schools, and again, we do this you know, every couple of weeks, we look at the new case rate among school staff and students compared to the statewide rate. It remains about 25% lower for schools than the statewide rate. But we do see this shift in, again, a much smaller number of long-term care outbreaks and healthcare outbreaks. Um, and I think, again, that means that the school outbreaks, which we are, again, pretty aggressive with our partners at DOE, we really want to make sure we're keeping kids and school staff safe. So we continue to do case investigation aggressively. We work with Department of Education on contact tracing aggressively. We updated our school protocol for all of this sort of work on April 1st. So we continue that work in the interest of trying to keep as many kids in schools learning as possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring up the nursing homes, Commissioner, because that was what I think made that seem so striking to me that it used to be that nursing homes were a place where we saw predominant outbreaks. And at least from the initial data, and I guess what I'm trying to understand is, are we seeing most of our outbreaks, regardless of how small they may be, in schools now as opposed to nursing homes or places of work? I think that's fair. Uh, we'll get you. We can we can query the list to to get the exact number or percentage, but we have seen a number of outbreaks. And again, a, a lot of it is just a function of what defines an outbreak. It's three or more cases of different households that have some epidemiological link. Um, and in many cases, it's three kids from different households who have confirmed cases of COVID, whose epidemiological link is that they all happen to be at the same school. That's why I, I say, you know, we, we haven't detected a lot of transmission in outbreak settings because they can be quite disparate. But I think it is fair to say the last time I looked at the global list of outbreaks, that many of them are school-based. A lot of that is what Commissioner Lambrew noted. It's what's not there anymore, which are long-term care facilities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, over to Evan Pop next. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, this is a question we received from um, a mom in Maine, and she wants to know what is being done to address um, structural barriers, barriers during COVID-19, like the lack of time off from work for a vaccine appointment um, and potential side effects, lack of time off, um, paid time off to stay at home with kids who are supposed to be quarantining, um, lack of childcare that would help for getting a shot without bringing kids along, or lack of support for um, home isolating if a primary caregiver gets sick. And then, um, you know, sorry, this is a bit of a long question, but she also worries that the um, concurrent need for the uptake of vaccinations and continued prevention of COVID-19 is being talked about in terms of attitude um, when barriers are often so much more practical and gendered. Um, so I know there's a lot there, but just kind of wondering um, what your response to that is. A very, very important question. I, I, I may start, but the commissioner and I talk a lot about how we can build out the exact types of social services to facilitate not just vaccination, but safe isolation, safe quarantine. Evan, you, you've been on these briefings for a year now. You, you've, you've heard us describe those, but this is an important topic and I'm glad we can discuss that. But let me start though by completely acknowledging and agreeing that sometimes we think of vaccination and we use words like hesitancy uh, to suggest that folks don't wish to be vaccinated. And we don't, we don't often acknowledge that there are a lot of folks who wish to be vaccinated, but may not have the wherewithal to make it happen for their life because of work requirements, travel requirements, other challenges like IT and accessing the internet. At least as to vaccines and vaccinations, early on we were concerned about that. So we've taken direct steps to address each of those. You've, you've heard us talk about the availability of having a ride. The same number I mentioned earlier, the community vaccination line, the same one to call to get a ride. It's also the same number you can call if, for example, using the internet is not for you, the phone line can help you get scheduled. You raised other questions though about social services and wraparound supports. I'll turn that over to Commissioner Lambert. Sure, so we have since last year, we built these services out, an array of different types of supports for people who either are in isolation because they tested positive for COVID-19 or in quarantine where they may have these struggles. So we offer, we support people in need for that kind of shelter. We've used some hotels on occasion to make sure people have a safe place to isolate. 
We offer psychosocial support because it's often very challenging to be in isolation. We wanna make sure people stay in isolation. Cultural brokering and interpretation services, we've expanded those services this year using our community-based organizations, transportation, childcare. People can find out and ask if they could get this kind of support by looking for support for isolation and quarantine on the main DHHS website. There's a simple form that people can fill out and we're committed to continuing to not just offer those services, but refine them. Providing this kind of temporary support for people pays off in the long run because we're keeping communities safe, keeping those families families safe, and really helping people get back on their feet. Um, and, and just to follow up a little bit, um, I don't know how much this is something that you can speak to, but um, you know, clearly those those are services that are being offered. Do you feel like there are um, people who are still kind of falling um, between the cracks of those services or, or um, what's your sense of kind of um, that, that type of issue? We, we, we always can do better. We're always looking to figure out how we can better connect people who might need these services to these services. Uh, you know, so it's always a challenge to make sure that people take advantage of the options that are out there. So I'm glad we have the opportunity here today to, to talk about it because we often don't. But we will continue that work, working with our community part partners, our healthcare facilities, for example, have been great referral sources, our hospitals, our emergency rooms. We again have different you know, community action programs that um, are real partners here. So we will continue to try to find those people who may need that help and connect them to these services. Evan, if I may, uh, if you're watching this right now, for, for those of you who are watching and you're saying, gosh, I didn't, I didn't know that was available. Boy, I could really use a ride or I could really use some help scheduling. I'd just like to take another opportunity to read out the phone number to call. That number for our community vaccination line is 888-445-4111. And so if you're watching and you think, gosh, I could benefit from any, if not all of those services to help me get a vaccine, call today, please. Thank you. Uh, the last question for the day goes to Brian Sullivan. Best for last, undoubtedly. Uh, Dr. Shaw, uh, I have just a clarifier here um, about maybe Commissioner Lambrew's opening um, statements about uh, schools and the testing. Now, the, uh, the, the, the testing that's going to be done at schools, is that going to be as kids come back from vacation or is that as they head out? Why don't I answer and then Dr. Shaw, you jump in. We sent out, uh, Commissioner Macon and I sent out to all schools last week, an invitation to use the rapid test, the by next now testing, in the same way that one of the school districts came to us and proposed, which is they're gonna do testing Saturdays and Sundays. So the test result can be back. So the school staff and students are ready to go on Monday morning. But because it's rapid testing and that test is best when you do it several times in a row, they'll offer second clinics to do testing Tuesday, Wednesday of that week to make sure that those people who might've been traveling or otherwise um, enjoying themselves on vacations have tested negative as they go back to school. I will note that we also in that same guidance expanded the types of uses for those testing. So for example, some of our schools have asked about doing that kind of testing for special events like graduations or sports events or other sorts of reasons why they may wanna do some extra screening testing. We are now supporting the use of these rapid tests for that kind of regularized uh, testing to make sure that uh, we are keeping people in school safe. Now, I guess, uh, I know, I'm sure you talk about what you want to address uh, during these, these briefings. Why did you feel it was necessary to sort of reaffirm the things about testing and, and the importance of it? Are you, are you worried about something you're seeing? Or are you worried that people are going to go off to Disney uh, and come back and things are gonna be a little worse than they are right now? Uh, I'll just begin by saying, yes, we always yeah. worry. Our job, <laughs> our job is to worry and yeah. we do it really well. And, um, you know, we do have these, these options that our testing volume as Dr. Shaw has said over these weeks has flagged a little bit. It's not as high as it was. So we just wanna take the opportunity to remind people, especially since sometimes people think, well, more people are vaccinated in my community. I haven't gotten vaccinated, but maybe I don't need to wear that mask or you know, do what I used to do. We still need to follow those protocols. It's still critically important. And testing is one of the tools that helps people keep, keep people safe. 
and, and Brian, I, I'm just reminding, I'm reminded of someone uh, who used to be at the US CDC, who did a lot of emergency preparedness, whose lectures I learned a lot from, who, who once uh, characterized public health emergency preparedness as the job of worrying in advance. So that's, that's <laughs> just what we do. And I guess, I know that we love local control here in, in the state and I'm not uh, saying anything against it, but was there any discussion or thought that maybe with this week of vacation, we slap on an, another week and, and try to go remote just to sort of mitigate any issues that may arise from, from travel? Well, we do know that some schools did that in and around Thanksgiving and the New Year's holiday breaks. It is a tool that some of our school districts have used to try to help with COVID-19 outbreaks. As a reminder though, we did um, in the month of March offer special clinics for school older school school staff and teachers. We, at the president's direction, had our pharmacies getting federal supply exclusively offer vaccination for school staff, staff and teachers. So we are hopeful that this time around, things might be not as challenging for schools as uh, people return from vacation. All that said, we still don't have a vaccine authorized for children under the age of 16. We still know that getting a vaccine for those children or youth ages 16 and 17 is a little bit more difficult because they're only able to get the Pfizer vaccine. So for those reasons, we have offered school districts these extra tests. We're giving advice, support, and we're hopeful that we can roll out even more testing in, in May with pooled testing for classrooms, other sorts of regularized testing to help schools get as many of their children back in the classroom as possible. And last thing I promised, uh, Evan asked you maybe a little bit about some of the barriers. So just a question maybe for, for Dr. Shore or, or Commissioner Lambrew, the importance of these weekend clinics for people who maybe their job doesn't allow them to scoot away uh, just, and maybe the future of those as those people become the ones who haven't been able to get vaccinated, any kind of expansion. Yep, Brian, the, the weekend appointments are, are, are really, really important. Um, We've also spoken with sites like drive through type locations to talk about pre-work hours and after work hours as well with the same idea. Um, I've also had very preliminary, and I wanna stress very preliminary conversations with some site operators in Maine about having unscheduled hours, walk-up hours essentially. It's not gonna be for everyone, it's not gonna be everywhere, but there might be some locations in the state where there's a higher degree of walkability where having some degree of unscheduled hours is what makes it that much easier to get vaccinated. Those are some of the ideas that we're thinking about. Uh, again, to remove every single barrier, more hours, different days, day, morning, night, and then maybe even unscheduled. Thank you both. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and Brian's question was the last one. So Commissioner, I'll turn it back over to you to close us out. Sure. So we are proud of the progress that main providers, main people, main volunteers have made in vaccination. We are getting close to that 50% point where more than half of people eligible for our vaccine have gotten a first dose. We will celebrate when we get there, but that still leaves half of people who are eligible for vaccination, plus those who are not yet authorized to get a vaccination unprotected as we go into these spring months with the weather getting nice, people getting out more, people gathering more, but with those gatherings, wearing those masks, keeping that distance and getting tested. You can, even if you don't travel, there are options here in the state of Maine for you to get a test to just make sure that if you've been out and about and you have a suspicion that you might've been exposed, you can get a test, get that result and help keep yourself, your family, your community safe. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Thanks to our colleagues in the media today. And thanks to all of you for taking some time out of your day to join us hear the latest about where we are. We look forward to chatting with everyone again soon, but in the meantime, please be kind and take care of one another. See everyone later.